waiting to see Sanaya. What else is this if not love? Make messy moves with Star Set. Welcome one, welcome all one more time here on your wonderful show. It's a beautiful, beautiful Sunday here in Johannesburg, South Africa, Midrand, Galaxy Universal Network. Your host, Maponga J, discussing African stories, real stories, and uh, trying to find solutions around our society and our community. Our society has been infested uh, with uh, lots, of, lots of issues which have resulted in criminal activities. Uh, whether they are legitimate criminal activities, psychological criminal activities, economically driven or politically driven, the system has built up a jailing system where quickly if anything goes wrong with a community member, then they are taken away from the community and they are dumped in these concrete blocks. If you remember a few weeks ago, we did a program with Tapelo, who has uh, written a book entitled From uh, Prison to Pulpit, something like that, if I remember well, where he was also relating his experience. And this morning we'll be talking to Elder Smith. Daddy Smith, please greet the viewers out there. Good morning, everybody that is watching. Uh, it's a pleasure that I can find myself in the presence of Mr. Noponga also. And uh, yes, uh, as he has related to you, we are certainly facing uh, uh, certain things in our communities, which sometimes is unsavory. Mm. But uh, yes, to speak about those things, uh, it is also uh, uh, something that must be given priority. Mm. Thank you for hosting me. Good morning to everybody. And thank you for... Uh, let's get down to business. Who is uh, Smith and where does he come from? And uh, let's hear a little bit of your background and what ended up, uh, what ended, resulted you being in the prison walls. And uh, how long did that take and what happened there? And maybe towards the end of the show, you can be giving us some tips and advices to the young people out there who think that maybe playing around breaking law is a playing game and they think that jail is actually an option for life. So maybe introduce us to uh, your background, where you come from and who is Mr. Smith? Uh, I, I am Edward Smith. I grew up in a place called Westbury, very notorious for uh, very wrong reasons as well. And, uh, Westbury in Johannesburg, yeah? Yes, in Johannesburg. Where is Westbury on the south? Westbury is in the southwestern part of uh, 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 Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. uh, it was previously known as Western Township, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the name has been now is now been called Westbury. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I grew up in Westbury. We, uh, family came from, uh, you know, uh, the previously Sophia Town. Mm. Uh, that was the, the famous Sophia Town. The famous Sophia uh, the Marabi, the Marabi and uh, Midlands uh, swing days. Yes, yes, the guys from uh, and mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. But uh, I was very little then when they prevailed in uh, so Sophia Town. Mm. And uh, as a young kid, I grew up in Westbury after the forced removals. Mm. And uh, yes, uh, as Westbury is well known. Uh, for all its... Uh, uh, what happens in Westbury? What happens in Westbury? Just uh, Westbury is a community that uh, has been overtaken by uh, criminal activity. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, speaking, uh, you know, deliberately bad about the, the place, but I grew up in a place and I understand uh, the psychology that is prevailing in Westbury. Mm. So, you know, uh, it is very easy for a person growing up, for a young man growing up in Westbury, to become associated with criminal activities mm. because uh, the you know the 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 way that people love the the, the system in Westbury is so uh, so structured that uh, uh, gang activity prevails and then one find that you may find that if you are in a certain territory you end up becoming a gang member of that territory. Mm. 
uh, because somehow for you just to s live in a certain and survive place, in some of those places yes you cannot easily uh, frequent other territories because it belongs to different gangs and all mm. that well that was uh, in the yesteryears of Westbury as it was there. What are some of the gang names that you still remember from the yesteryears? Uh, the, you know the very famous uh, gangs that, uh, uh, that, that, that were there in Westbury was uh, Spaldings, mm. Fast Guns, and also there were some Americans, Vikings, those were the, the, the forefathers of gangsterism. Mm. And uh, the culture just continued and uh, even now it is being upheld. Uh, uh, there are certain things that happen, but you know the names change. But it is the very same thing that uh, mm. reemerges time after time. Although the Spaldings are no longer there, the Varados are there now. Although the Varados can uh, be totally uh, gone one day, the disciples are there now. And you know, as each and every generation emerges. Uh, this culture. So basically, it's an, it's an inheritance it is an of gangster yes, culture of within gangster Westbury. Culture within Westbury. And what happened within those gangsters and uh, stuff? What sort of activities happen in there? Yes, the activities are mainly associated with uh, uh, drug, uh, drug uh, trafficking, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, all contraband uh, 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 activities. Mm. Uh, you know. Uh, you will find that these youngsters, they engage themselves in these activities uh, because to them that is the economy they understand. Mm. Mm. And uh, you know, so much so that uh, the effects of it are even on to the, the, the elder people, the mm. parents, mm. are also uh, becoming part of that uh, culture and also uh, 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 adopt to accept that culture in their own homes as well. But most likely they grow up under the same culture, yes. so they are more tolerant. Yes, they are more towards tolerant. The yes, because you know, no, speaking about that, you find that it has become a norm for them. Mm. So uh, imagine if it's a norm to the parents. How about the children? What about the children? How do they raise their children? So you know, uh, it is just becoming a more and more uh, a, a, a dangerous. And, uh, you know, although there are people that feel that this is part of, of, of their life, they, they grew up here, you know, it's not everybody that is, uh, 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 you know, uh, have been swallowed up by this culture, not mm. everybody. There are some people there that are resistant to that, to mm. that culture. Mm. But, you know, it's hard for a person to, to, to just say that uh, I can get out of this place and go live my life in a better environment mm. because they feel that they are part of the environment they are part of the that community of yeah. the community and you've built relationships with neighbors yeah. and everything else and yes mm. yes and it's hard for them just to say I, I must leave pack up my things and leave this community mm. but then you know uh it is not just uh, uh the framework of that uh, type of uh, lifestyle it's not just based on uh what is happening internally there mm. There are also external factors that contribute a lot towards the behavior of mm. uh, the, 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 the community at large. And uh, those are the things of uh, how drugs uh, come into the township. Into the township, because they're not, yes. they're not being manufactured they from there. They are not being manufactured. They're most likely being manufactured somewhere else, and they make their way into the community. Into the community. That's how it is. Guns and all those weapons. Are so you're basically, you're looking at drugs. Yes. You're looking at guns. Yes. You're looking at uh, maybe crime. You're looking at murders. Yes. You're looking at um, you know uh, hijacking issues. You're yes. looking at sex. You're looking at basically a community where even the police will have to think first before they approach certain corners of that community. Of course, that's, that, that's how it is. And then also, you know, how it has, uh, the effect that it has on the, the, the policing system itself, because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I can tell you one thing, Mr. Maponga, is that, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, such a lot of uh, uh, money flowing around in the township. In that community, of, yes, because of those drugs. Because of drug trafficking. And, and, and other uh, 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 activities, mm. contraband activities that are ensuing there. But the police, even though they come with, uh, you know, they are motivated to come and, and investigate and try to bring a solution to certain things, uh, they fall into the trap of being um, bribed. bribed. 
and all that because of so the police have become part of the community they are part of the problem part of the problem as well <laughs> And of the, I hope, um, but in uh, Peggy uh, wherever you are in South Africa, there you are listening to what we are saying, and maybe this video will make its way to you. We have a hot spot for drugs, and that is Westbury, right here in uh, Johannesburg, which needs your attention. And uh, uh, the Sophia Town Police Station is not coping with uh, some of the activities that are happening there, as high cases of uh, bribes and etc. And some of the people in the community such as Mr. Edwards uh, here, can actually maybe take you through and show you the greater part of the city and so that you understand the psychology of the crime and criminal activities that are happening within that greater area. How did you end up in these gangs? Uh, well, you know, uh, normally what happens is that uh, how you associate in the community. And uh, very often, uh, if you are not part of a certain group of friends that you that, uh, that you are staying with in your close proximity, mm. uh, then, uh, you know, you feel like being left out. You might even you want to belong. bullied mm. uh, because you are a loner. Mm. You are not like the rest of the guys and uh, things like that. You know, even at schools uh, sometimes, you find that there are groups, there are cliques mm. Mm. that are... They're already, that are already linked to, yeah. the, to the gangs in, on the street. Yes, yes. yes. Understand, children of, 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 of gangsters of senior gangsters and so forth and you know the culture that prevails there that uh, makes an innocent child just wants to become part of this group that is uh, according to him or her maybe enjoying a, a different lifestyle and which is attractive to them mm. so uh, there are uh, lots of uh, 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 issues you know that uh, attracts uh, young young guys young people young children to become gangsters mm. And, uh, you know, uh, some of them is even, you know, for a young uh, uh, person to watch movies on TV always and seeing the crime that is being committed and how movies, uh, you know, uh, expresses violence and all that. Mm. And then, you know, for this young child to be given a firearm, it is like an ego for mm. a, a bird, a, a ego bird. You've just become a movie star. Yes. I mean, you see these guys on TV and next time you also have a gun and you feel you are Wesley Snipes. Yes. You, you, you can... <laughs> yes, and it's a, the association of drugs mm. uh, involve uh, the involvement of drugs and all that and the monies that are being, uh, you know, uh, that goes from hand to hand and mm. all that. Uh, these children see these things and it, uh, it appeals to them in a certain way. And, uh, you know, because at home, it, it might be that uh, there's uh, poverty at home. It mm. might be that there's... This a, is an escape. Yes, and, and this is an escape. I mean, as young girls today look for sugar daddies and so forth, mm. understand, because they want that extra, uh, you know, care or to be cared for and all that, or those material things that they... That they yearn and they fall into the trappers. Uh, so is it also with the youngsters, understand. They fall into that trap of being lured into the organization. Of, uh, of 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 what prevails there, mm. and they become part of it. it now, let's go. Let's go to your, let's go to your story. How let's go to your story exactly as to how did it end up on your table and your own experience? Yeah. No. Uh, well, you know, uh, as I have explained, uh, being a youngster, uh, being you know, looking at uh, other uh, bigger guys as your role models, and uh, you know, not uh, really understanding who to look at and just following in the trends that are set by those uh, elder people and all that mm. and uh, you now wanting to copy also what they do and all that from a very young age i, I found myself uh, 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 being a gambler in the streets and I i've never been taught such things at home mm. i can honestly say that you know uh, uh, my, my my parents were very strict they they did not uh, want me to live that type of a life because mm. I was always reprimanded, I was mm. always punished. But you were choosing your own way. But you know, once out there in the street, you become a different person mm. because that's where the culture prevails. But at home, you change again. Mm. It is uh, like that. So you know, many of us have a, a dual personalities. Mm. We we can be uh, the sweet forthcoming people that wants you know to be just be loved and be accepted. But once we are there with the cliques out there, we, we are different people. Also. Different animals, Olga. And, and that's what happened to me. And, you know, uh, my father died when I, I, I was uh, around uh, 12 or 13 years old. 
And uh, it was really bad because my mom uh, had to raise uh, seven children. And uh, yeah, uh, so she had to go and work and all that. But you know, as it was during those times of uh, apartheid, uh, our people really didn't uh, get, uh, you know, money, the money that they deserved for the work that they gave to their employers and all that. So mm. uh, I had to leave school. My sisters, my elder sisters had to leave school and we had to go and work to Early. help supply, yes, mm -hmm. to help support uh, the other uh, siblings, which were still very small. I had to start working at the age of 16 years. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, uh, I was uh, uh, introduced into the, work for, uh, the, 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 the workforce and uh, I learned to become a cabinet maker. Mm -hmm. And, a carpenter. Yes, to be yeah. a carpenter. And uh, yes, uh, but even so, you know, uh, you have to work on, at uh, that time the system was like, uh, you know, you have to be an apprentice. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wages was not really uh, something that you, you could look forward to. Uh, it was just like that, that uh, once I got it, I have to give it to my mother. Mm -hmm. And I, I always never had enough money for myself. So besides from working, I also had my extra activities on the sideline mm. of uh, criminal uh, criminal activities and so mm. forth and you know but it just took the better part because somehow you cannot always prevail you cannot always continue to commit what crimes. type of what type of small little crimes were you doing there like you know uh, theft and uh, you know uh, uh, where gambling was also illegal then and mm. you know uh, uh, as gangs we would go about you know uh, committing robbery sometimes, committing uh, housebreaking and stealing and all that. But, uh, you know, we were so focused because of uh, what happened then during uh, those years. It was that it was better for you to go and steal from the whites mm -hmm. uh, and not from your own community. And, you know, where Westbury is situated, it is central to what you will find. There's an industrial area, and then there, just across the road, was this uh, place that is called West Dean and mm. Triumph. Mm. And uh, those were the areas where the whites were living in and all that. And we would frequent those places to go and commit uh, mm. crime. And harvest. Yes, harvest. Mm. Our, uh, <laughs> it was, they, they used to call it a, a appropriation of wealth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they found a political way of saying, no, we're not stealing. Yes. We're just equalizing, you know. Yes, where, yeah. <laughs> yes it was yes, kind of like that attitude that we had mm. and saying taking from uh, those people is really justified. Mm. And uh, because of uh, the way they treat us, mm. but uh, really uh, the damage is is is, is right there where it happens. Mm. Besides the mentality that we are taking, f uh, what rightfully should be ours, being involved in criminal activities changes a person. Mm. And uh, as soon it wasn't soon after that that uh, I got caught, and um, I was uh, sentenced. Uh, uh, for uh, 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 our sentence for damage to property, mm. because you know uh, one you uh, broke into a house or a factory. Uh, what happened is uh, I, I, I robbed a white uh, guy. I, I, I snatched the money out of his hand mm. and I ran away. But uh, the shop owner knew me because I used to always go to that shop and buy. And so uh, he called the cops and he pointed me out. So I was sentenced and I was given a, 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 a uh, you know, that time they had that sentence of, of hitting you with a, a cane. Mm. I was given what, what they call it, a, 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 yes, you, you would be beaten up. The shambok do a bit. Shambok you mm. <laughs> and all that. But uh, I was so angry with that shopkeeper that I went to smash his shop and his car because uh, uh, he should have known that we are the people that support him and uh, mm. why did he call the cops and fingered me out? Mm. Because we are really the people that support him at his shop. Mm. So I smashed his windows at the shop and I smashed the windows of his car and then I was caught again and sent to prison. <laughs> For the second time? <laughs> For the second time. Now that time now it was more severely because they said no, uh, you, you are not a good citizen. Yes. <laughs> so I had to be imprisoned uh, for six months. Six months. In the then. Uh, the first one was how many months? No, it wasn't. Uh, it was, you were just shambok. I was just you. Shambok, yes. The second one, you it's escalated uh, to six months now. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the strange now, the thing is that when you are in prison, something else happens also. 
there's a different attitude that develops into you, an attitude of resistance and all that. Because now you are amazed to find that, uh, you know, we are all blacks here in prison and all that, but there is an oppressive uh, 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 oppressiveness that mm. prevails there as well. Hold it right there. Let us hear what our politicians and our local leaders, uh, both Babu Pekitele and some of the political heads, are saying about violence and criminal activities that is happening around South African communities. I mean, look at Google, for example, the cap flats. Not only that, Kwamashu used to be popular for similar stuff. And, uh, you know, what, what, what exactly? Uh, how do we begin to deal with criminal activities, though they've been precipitated by political unrest in our country. Let us take a look at some of a few of these videos. We we'll beg with you. Outmost agency, the National Executive Committee has noted that the Minister of Counter is dealing with the issue of influencing swearing challenges and avoid to further avoid the contamination of the value and restore the dignity of affected communities. We have also focused on crime, gender-based violence, as well as corruption. The NEC continues to be gravely concerned about the scores of gender-based violence, crime, gangsterism that plug our communities, undermining their basic right to safety and their human dignity. These include the areas such as Cape Flats, Langa, Gugule, Tukaya Lisha, Mitchell's Plain, and the recent uprising in Westbury that led to the gang-related murder of a mother. The ANC instructs its employees in government throughout the country and various spheres to take whatever steps necessary to bring gang violence under control and welcomes the implementation of the Bambanani program. <laughs> That's one. Let us see the Then we'll investigate those that you say they are corrupt and we would like to work with you to give us information so that we so that we immediately act on that. You have requested the police to be here. I'll come to that. You have requested the police to send a special unit called TRUT to be part of the community so that they can begin to push back the gangs. That unit will be here as from today. Welcome back here. Beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning here in Johannesburg Galaxy Investor Network. Your program is Sankofa. Your host is Maponga J. Sitting with me is uh, Utata Edward Smith, telling us through his uh, life story of how he lived up in Westbury and ended up in prison. And of course, it started off with a, with a spanking from the police station, which escalated to him coming back to the shop. Uh, to the shop owner who had identified him, vandalized the shop, broke the windows and etc. They picked him up, locked him up for six months. 
And then after that? Yes, after that, when I was released uh, from that uh, six months in imprisonment, uh, I, I thought that, no, uh, prison is not a good place. You know, the experience that I had there, because you must remember those days, it was hard labor and all that. Mm. And I said, no more. And I went to look for work. Proper work. Uh, yes, I got a job again, the very same uh, uh, place where I worked before. Mm. Uh, the, the employer took me back and put me on the program again for uh, being an apprentice to study for, uh, to learn for a trade. Mm. And uh, yes, as soon as that, uh, I finished that trade, uh, I started uh, selling my labor. So at least you finished, you finished the, the, yes, the training? The, yes, the training. Oh, wow. And uh, I went now to sell my labor and all that, but you know, uh, yeah, I got involved with uh, my wife that I married. We were still young and uh, yes, we got married and everything, but now, during the early 90s, just after the release of uh, Tata Nelson Mandela, I remember that, uh, you know, the economy was uh, in, uh, very, very uh, yes, yeah. shaky and all that. And uh, yes, people uh, you must remember that we had foreign employers and all that all mm -hmm. the time. And um, they left. They left South Africa. Even the person that I worked for, they, they went. They were not sure of the political environment. Yes, they were not. So they just closed their shops and ran away. And ran away. Some to Australia, some to New Zealand, some back to Britain. Yeah. Yes, yes. I was working for a German and uh, they went back to Germany. And uh, yes, I found myself being unemployed, having this burden that, uh, you know, uh, 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 my children are young, my wife, and, uh, you know, I have to look out for them. And then there was this thing that was happening all the time in the township drugs. Mm. I fell into that uh, part also and I, you know, I explored opportunities there and I started dealing in drugs as well. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, I soon discovered that uh, the vibrancy of that uh, market uh, of that market is very uh, detrimental really. And uh, yes, uh, as soon as you prosper in that market, you have to have the defenses. Guns are on your back. Guns, guns are, are on your back. And guns are coming up now. And you, by the way, you're, you're a drug dealer, you always have cash. You, yes. And you're also a target from other criminals. Yes, yes. You are also a target of other criminals. And some things may start very small, but indeed they are not small. Hmm. Because, you know, uh, people build up an attitude towards you hmm. as a drug dealer because you are prospering and they don't. So, uh, yes, there was fighting that occurred. How much money were you making at your peak? Uh, you know, during those days, uh, I would say 5,000 rands was a whole lot of money uh, then, you know. Per day? Per day, yes. Mm. And, uh, yes, uh, I, you know, I was still very particular even in, in that sense because uh, the drugs that I was selling was not uh, drugs that were used by non-whites. Mm. Uh, I was selling drugs that were mainly used by whites only, mm. those that they inject. So you, 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 you are very focused on your, on your target market. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from the days you were snatching things, you were focused on the white community. This time around, you come with a drug strictly for the white community. Yes, yes, it was there, and I just took uh, uh, the opportunity of, uh, you know, exploiting it further and all that. But, uh, you know, I wasn't so clever after mm. all, you know, because these things just happened because I have set my mind on saying I just want to make provision for my family, mm. that's all. I was not saying that I wanted to become a wealthy drug merchant and mm. all that. Uh, and I was also just contemplating to just meet, make my ends meet and all that. And I was saying to myself, I'm going to leave this thing. I'm going to leave. I saw the dangers involved in mm. that thing. But uh, I think as soon as you start saying to yourself, I'm out of this, then uh, some other people, your opponents have already made up their mind also in a different way to say no. Because it's a, it's a game that is like a game that, that says, um, let us get rid of him so that we can get our market back. Mm. And well, as long as you are there, you are a threat. You are a threat to them. And you know, uh, what happens in that, in that uh, uh, environment is that there are no negotiations like in the business, formal business environments and all that. Uh, if they want to get rid of you, it means they, they must kill you. Mm. And uh, what happened to me is that there was an assassination attempt on me, and uh, unfortunately I also had a firearm, and uh, I shot uh, two people, and uh, while the police were looking for me, and you know the thing works so, so it's so so integrated that uh, police are being told that we are going to uh, get rid of that person. Mm. 
And so, so they're on standby. Yes, they're on standby. They know also how they are going to investigate uh, this, the, 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 the case and all that. So that they must, there mustn't be any evidence. Mm. And, and then uh, the people who have planned it have already paid them. And, uh, yes. They pay you to come and kill you. Yes, they pay to come and kill you. They pay the police. Yes. To come and kill us if they Yes. <laughs> yes, that's how it happened then, understand. And really, I can even tell the policeman that was involved in my case, I can even tell it in his face today. Mm. Uh, you know the police. Yes, I know. I know even what transpired and all that. You know, because prison is a very different uh, environment. Once you are there, other criminals also come. And truth comes in, out. And then we share the truth with one another, and the truth just comes out in prison. Me, I did this one, and I got this one. Yes. This other guy did this. And yes, you also discover our, your story is also yes. in the mix of in the, the other mix. stories. Yes, of course. Because you see, even the opponents sometimes find themselves in, in prison. You're now sharing, you're now now sharing, we are sharing <laughs> cells now. Yes, we are sharing cells, and we are uh, uh, starting to talk about about what happened, mm. what made us to be here, and then mm. the truth just comes out. And that day, what happened? That day, that day. <laughs> that day, no. uh, what happened was that I was saved by a leather jacket. <laughs> and uh, I must go and buy myself one too. <laughs> what happened was it was a stolen leather jacket mm. that I bought. And uh, I had a brown leather jacket on. And somebody came and, and sold me another brown leather jacket. So I was with this friend of mine. I said, you can have it on so long. Uh, I'll get it from you when we go back home because we were not uh, uh, at, our, uh, at home. But uh, I was already targeted. But uh, the guys that were supposed to shoot me were told that he is wearing a brown leather jacket. Damn. And uh, now we were two with brown leather jackets. And when they came, those guys, they were a bit confused. So they just thought, no, let us shoot both of the brown leather jackets. <laughs> and they started shooting my friend. He ended up in a wheelchair and um, he was paralyzed from the waist down. But that same time when they shot him, I took out my firearm and I shot those guys. It was an exchange of gunfire and I was very lucky to survive with them being shot. Mm. Not me. And uh, I think the cops were very disappointed mm. because of that and uh, because I was supposed to die, mm. not those people. And uh, there was a So you, you, you knocked two of them off? I knocked two of them off. And, uh, but your friend was, your friend friend was shot? My got shot. You were safe? No? Not, I was not harmed. No was, scratch? Not a scratch. I was very lucky, you know, because to survive there because I was in the direct line of fire. The shower of bullets. Shower of bullets around me. I could feel the gunpowder hitting my face and all that. <laughs> but I was very lucky to survive that without a bullet mm. uh, uh, in my body. Uh, and when I shot those guys, the others ran away. Uh, and the police came. Eventually, the police came. I was eventually caught for that. And uh, I was uh, held in a uh, in uh, incarceration without bail. Now, uh, strangely, you know how these people operate is that they saw that, no, I didn't die, but they wanted me dead. And, uh, and now the court did not want to grant me bail. Hmm. But they organized with the investigating officer for me to get bail so that I must come out. Then they kill you. So that they can kill me. And uh, uh, that... Uh, you know, it was just a hint because now I was busy with drug dealing even inside prison. Your job was continuing now. <laughs> continuing in prison mm. because I needed no money for lawyers and mm. all that. So uh, when I went for the bail hearing, I was granted bail. To my surprise, I was granted bail, but I had money still there in prison that I needed to collect. Mm. So I said to my friend, do not take me out now. Come fetch me on Friday because I need to go and collect all my money and mm. all that. And uh, we agreed on that. And that was on the Monday. Strangely, the Wednesday, my wife said to me, hey, the police came there last night, and they said they are looking for you because you just killed two other people. But I was still in prison. <laughs> now, it was only the investigating officer that knew that I was granted bail, and mm. he thought that I was outside. Sure. So the they did a crime, and they wanted to frame me for that Frame one. me for that crime as well. But unfortunately, when I got out, they could not because I was in prison. 
But uh, you know, <laughs> that's quite interesting. <laughs> Hold it right there. The <laughs> video we're going to be showing is a bit graphic for those who are sensitive viewers. But again, we're going to be looking at what type of crimes are happening within the community. Here we are sitting with uh, Edward Smith relating his story also at the hands of the law and the mischief between the police and the gangsters within the Westbury area. Welcome back. Welcome back here as we are finalizing the story of uh, Edward Smith. And uh, be on standby. We have another beautiful story that is coming up of a wonderful lady who was given life sentence behind bars. For her to be here, it's a miracle. You want to hear exactly how the community is being treated with the legal system and the correctional services. And we are picking up all these stories and we want to share real life stories. You never know. You never know. We are all criminals waiting to be locked up. You can never say never. And uh, so it's, it's nice sometimes to understand what other people have gone through. So when you get when you get in the same situation also, you are upfront and uh, you know exactly what's happening. Now, there you are. Two people are said to have died and you are being implicated for the crime. You are behind bars. And uh, when you come out, you, you, you are being charged for two extra murders plus the other two. That makes it four. Mm. Uh, and, you know, uh, strangely, uh, uh, these people will be so adamant to make sure that uh, you go through the system because they failed uh, to take my life. So they were now using the system to make sure they get rid of me. Mm. And, uh, yes, uh, they were very hard on it and I was sentenced, you know, uh, consequently I, I was found guilty, convicted and sentenced. For which ones now? Uh, the first two? The first two mm. and one of the other two. The one you were not even there. Yes, yes. Uh, so you killed a person in absentia. In absentia, you can say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but uh, uh, very strangely, you know, as to how I was convicted also, it, it, it only took three days in the, uh, 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 the, the high court. Three days? Three days. I, I, I did not even say anything 
for that matter, and the judge was just there to sentence me, to find me guilty. And how many years did they knock the table? They gave me a 54-year prison sentence. 54? Yes. And uh, I was in prison for uh, 21 years. So you served, actually? Yes, I served. Full time? I served 21 years in prison. Uh, yes, it was a bit hard to accept that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm being sentenced so harshly. And, you know, finding myself in prison also, you know, you have to come to the terms of how life is there and you have to adopt as speedily as you can because you will find yourself... The gutter. In, yes. Uh, so, you know, I tried everything. I tried to raise my uh, concerns to the appeals court and all that. And uh, very strangely that, uh, you know, I never got answers for that. And uh, if, even when I got answers, uh, it was kept away from me. I was only given those answers on my release at uh, Community Corrections. And I was uh, very surprised as to those were the letters that I forwarded to the appeals courts and all those other people. So someone was just sitting on the documents? And it was just sitting on the documents. I, I had to stay in a maximum facility for 17 years. 17 years? Yes, you know, and it was very, very unusual because even people, I wasn't doing a life sentence because people that are doing life sentences, they stay in a maximum facility for eight years only. You spent 17 years? I spent so they wanted you out of the system? I, I, I can't understand why so harshly. But I survived. I survived. I studied in prison. I, 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 I established a library there, and I, you know, I got involved with a lot of other guys. We established a schooling system there. What did you study now in prison? Uh, I studied uh, 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 management. I studied uh, marketing. I studied um, uh, uh, entrepreneurship. I studied um, uh, business management as well. Mm. And uh, yes, uh, you know, I, I, I went there having only had a standard eight. You came back with a degree? I came back having studied management with the University of UNISA. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you hold a diploma from there? Uh, yeah, I, I studied with the Department of, of, uh, of uh, Education. Mm. Uh, also with uh, these N courses up to N6 in marketing, N4 in entrepreneurship. Mm. And four in uh, so basically, you were at university. You were at university. Yes, we were at university. You, you, so you were just collecting. <laughs> you were collecting degrees like they are going out of fashion. Yeah, you know, it, it is just the thing of coming to your senses mm. and realizing that crime is not exactly the way out for us. Uh, no matter the oppression we suffered and all mm. that, it does not need to make us become criminals mm. at the end of the day. And for any opportunity that can arise, it is. Uh, basically very right if you come to your senses mm. very quickly. The impact on your wife and children? Uh, sadly, however, is that, you know, the, the, the way people think outside is not how <laughs> uh, we perceive it inside and mm. all that. And, uh, you know, the sentiment is very different. Mm. And, uh, my wife divorced me mm. while I was there. Uh, my children uh, grew up without me. You know, because when I went to prison, they were just about nine and seven years old. But when I came back after 22 years, uh, uh, exactly, you can imagine I found adults there, no longer children. They have wives also. Uh, they, they have gone on with their lives, and it, it, uh, it's almost two generations later. Mm. So, you know. How many grandchildren you have now? I only have one grandchild, mm -hmm. uh, and there's one coming mm -hmm. from uh, uh, another relationship. And uh, yes, uh, that's how it is. You know, uh, prison really uh, isn't a nice environment to find yourself in. Mm. There's a lot of challenges there. And especially staying there for such a long time, mm. you really have to be strong to endure under those pressures there. What's your advice to the young people out there and the parents out there and uh, the community leaders out there? Yeah, you know, uh, our community leaders should be focused on, uh, you know, community building. And, uh, you know, the thing is what's happening, uh, especially like when I came back, I'm back in Westbury, 
The very same place, yes. The very same place that they've made. But with a man, no. Yeah. You, you have end your stripes. Time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, the sad part is that uh, if I remember the judge's words when he sentenced me, he said it is best for the community that I be removed and uh, imprisoned for a very long time. For, mm. And if he meant that it is best for the community, I'm sure that my absence in the community was going should to have enhanced the community. Should have enhanced the community for better development. But sadly, I came back and found the community. I, if I say ten times worse, I'm making a joke. Mm. I'm saying uh, forty times worse than you left. It. Than when I left. So my absence in the community, really, uh, from the community, wasn't really a deterrent mm. uh, to those that uh, were still there. Because uh, as it is, crime still continues to prevail in the community. In conclusion, what are you doing now? What are you doing with yourself now uh, in terms of integration in the community? Yes, uh, you know, I've tried many institutions, and sadly, institutions have a manner of uh, rejecting us mm. uh, who come from prison. Uh, it is a systematic manner that they can just let us, you know, isolate us from partaking into the econ economic cycle. But, uh, you know, I, I've, because I have the skill of being a carpenter, mm. I'm installing uh, cupboards, uh, bedroom cupboards, kitchen cupboards into people's homes. Mm. I make my living by that. And, uh, you know, I'm very good at that as well. And, uh, you know, that's how I continue because with the education that I've, I've uh, approached several uh, companies as well. Mm. I have this qualification, but I'm too old. Mm. <laughs> they would rather go and look for, for the young, a younger person, a postgraduate person, mm. a younger person, and all that. So that's the problem I have. I have this knowledge, but I can only give it to the youngsters that are mm. growing up now and say to them, there is hope in that. Try to empower yourself. Do not get attracted to what is happening in your environment stay away from uh, the things that are negative in your environment mm. and no matter how wh what the circumstances may be even if you have sometimes to go hungry to bed make it a prayer a prayerful thing that you you, you can talk to god also and 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 you can come out somewhere mm. in life where you will be needed by the country mm. or by the world mm. it's up to you you can make a difference mm. because the next person in that community won't help you so effectively. What they will do is try their best to destroy you. Mm. And that means they will always want you to be a drug user, a drug addict, substance abuser. They would always want you to be a, a, a criminal, a person that uh, can uh, bring stolen goods to them and all that. They would always want you to be a negative person. But look beyond that because, you know, really there is hope. We, mm. Westbury is situated in an area that you find there are so many institutions. Mm. There is the headquarters of the metropolis. There mm. is uh, two hospitals, major hospitals. And if also uh, Houghton Emergency Services. Yes. It's uh, just down the road. I went there to do some motivation the other week. You know. Yes, and even uh, UJ. UJ is a walking yes, distance. It's a walking distance. Wits is also a walking yeah. distance. Just along uh, on Deckers. On just ac Deckers. across the road, actually, the university is there. Yes. And Westbury is this community on the left. When you're going on... Yes, it's that community. I think I have an idea. I have an idea. Yes. And, and uh, in fact, even um, Wits. Yes, Wits. Wits University is... It's a, is, a walking it's distance. It's a stone throw away from there. Yes, uh, but they are not... Surrounded by so many opportunities. So many opportunities. It's amazing. But they are so blinded and focused... And SABC... It's, it's a is a, is a walking distance, and um, uh, and all those media houses yes. are long morning side. Yes. Come on, guys. If you live in Westbury, I don't think you need to make an excuse. You are surrounded by so many opportunities. The choice and the call is in your hands to say, what do you do with opportunities that are sitting in front of your door? Crime is not a way of life. And with me, Mr. Edward Smith has shared his life story. Your future is in your hands. Make some better decisions. Let's not do crime, but let us build our community. And for the police department out there, pull up your socks, guys. Sooner or later, we might have to call some of these guys and we start uh, naming and shaming some of you police officers out there who are involved in these crimes, including judges, including prosecutors who have put their hands in the criminal pockets. And we know for sure you are being paid by these criminals. And at the end of the day, you are not only destroying 
the lives of those that are participating, but the lives of the children and the future of the country is in your hands. If we don't have a good judiciary system and a good policing system, we cannot do better than that, but destroy the future which belongs to us and that's the future of our children. When we come back on top of the break, we're going to be sitting around and listening to a lady that was sentenced to life imprisonment. Thank you very much, Mr. Edward Smith, for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mpongo. And I thank also all the viewers for the... the and man, you can put, we'll put his contact details if you're in Johannesburg, Greater Johannesburg area, and you want him to come and fit in some cupboards for you, or you want to hire a man. He's got management skills, entrepreneur, he's a trainer, he's an educator, and he's a marketing guru now, plus a handyman in terms of his hands. Come on, guys, show some love, show some love, get his numbers, and let us support him in what he's doing. We'll be putting the, his numbers at the bottom of the screen there, uh, Mr. Edwards Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mpongo. People are short, yes, we react on that, but most of the time, people that would have been short are not short and you would not know about it. Ask us, we'll tell you the story. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Just the beginning. Make massive moves. Get out. Get out of this place. I love you. Do you love me? Yes. I like this. Someone stole from me yesterday. It was not my fault now. Hmm? Leave Lisa, me your head. That's your head. No, don't shoot, sir. Please. Please don't kill us. I give anything you want. Make massive moves with Star's head. Make massive moves. So from the theater stage to the kitchen. I'm anxiously awaiting to see Sanaya. What else is this if not love? Make massive moves with Starside. Make massive moves. Bible is human and divine. It's important for us to remember. And I'm part of God's story. God is sealing you. God says what he means, and he means what he says. God is good. I am very grateful to God. I am healed. Amen. 
Big Messy Moves with Stars Head. Make massive moves. There isn't any time to waste then. We can't save everyone in this war. One moment, that's all we got. You're locked in here with me. Make massive moves with Stars Head. to eat healthy food because it's delicious. Make massive moves. Would you like another one? I love it. I love this soup. This is amazing. The grits are so creamy. Oh, I take pride in my grits. No, so flavorful. I think that looks wonderful. Yeah. It's so incredible. Make massive moves with Stars Hat. Make massive moves. The space race has already started. Russia had got the first object in space. The coast is as wild today as it was when Europeans settled the continent. Enormous beasts with enormous thirst. The teens are primed and ready. They got the first animal in space and they got the first person. Time to see what the boys can do. Make massive moves with Starsight. When I was young, I would speak only Shangani apparently. From zero to about four or five years. Then I left the Shangani area. I was born in Bigita, but my mother and father had a farm in Matsiba Mele. Just across the Lundi River in the place they call Chilonga. So, Babu Labula Shangani Legia. What he lives here? What he lives Yes, let's hear your story, madam. I got quite disturbed when I had some uh, highlights of your story and uh, your plight at the hands of the legal system. And what happened? Maybe let's start off with who is, who is Kensani Chauke? Oh, Kensani Chauke was born in Palabura. Palabura. In Limpopo. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was just this young girl that was just eager to be a miner, or I liked mining so much that okay. I yeah, studied 
and you studied for mining yeah i studied mining how far i ended up being a mining official okay. employed by harmony gold mine harmony in, gold mine yeah harmony gold mine here yeah, went to yes it yes. was harmony gold mine then but now it's called sibanye sibanye yeah so i worked for harmony gold mine for about four years i'm the fifth born of um uh, the late rexon Shikombani and uh, Margaret Shikombani. We mm. are nine at home. Nine at home. Yeah, I love my family. That's so a much. beautiful family. <laughs> large family. Large family. Yes. My grandfather had how many sons? Twelve sons and six daughters. Yes. So I grew up in a, I grew up in a in a community. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I understand that nine is a good number. And yeah, boys eat there, number. girls eat there. Yes. And uh, you, you. and yeah, we are that big family. Now we had. Um, 22 grandchildren and one great grandchild. My yeah, word. That's a tribe. Yeah. The next my tribe. Family. Yes, the next tribe. <laughs> <laughs> you must make a big t shirt and give me one also. I the next tribe. I yeah. definitely do. Yeah. Yeah, so I worked at the mining um, industry for quite some time as a mining official until in 2004 uh -huh. when uh, the man that I was married to. Uh. Um, was shot and killed at home a few months after that it happened that the lady that was uh, doing interior decor in my house because i just moved to a new house so she came with the people that were doing gardening uh, service and all of that while they were working i had to go because that particular day it was on my birthday i'll never forget it was on the 28th of september I had to go, I was doing night shift. Uh, at the mine? At the mine. I had to go to work. When I was at work uh, that particular night in the morning, because we were doing, uh, we were giving each other lifts. There was a guy by the name of Paul that gave me a lift that particular night. We were not using my car, we were using his car. So okay. he came to fetch me that morning, went back home. Uh, the morning of the 29th now. The day after your birthday. Day after my birthday, as I was asleep, the police officers came into my house and I was sleeping. I remember I was sleeping. I was staying with my elder brother because he started working in um, somewhere in the those in those areas. So he knocked in my office and they, I mean, sorry, in, no, in, your bedroom. in my room, my bedroom. And they knew very well when I'm from work, I don't want to be disturbed. OK. But the way he knocked and he kept on saying, um, until come, you know, they call me until I'm Antoinette, uh, until come out. They're looking for you. I said, you know, I'm sleeping. He said, no, it doesn't look good at all. What I'm seeing outside, what's happening? No, you have to come out. And then I dressed up, I went outside. I was still tired because I was from work. There were a lot of police officers in the house. And, you know, they were wearing privates, like they call them CIDs or so. They were starting to search the house. They cuffed me and all of that. My child was about six months, I think, Whoa. seven months dead. They cuffed me. They told me that you are under arrest. For what? No, let's go to the police station. We're taking you for questioning. They took me to the police station. When I was at the police station, they told me that the people that were doing your interior decor last night, their husband was murdered, was hijacked, robbed, and your killed. Husband. No, the man, the, the husband to the lady that was uh, doing uh, okay. interior decor. In you, gave, you gave someone a job at your house? Yes. Yeah. And that man who came to work at your house? Is the man and the, actually it was their wife that was doing the job. Okay. Yeah, so it was, I was still new in that area because I just bought a new house in that particular area. So while I was in that area, I looked for, there were people that assisted me, said, no, there's a lady that is doing very nice curtains and all of that. She okay. Was, yeah, I was still young then, 24, and she was older than me. Still pushing and, you, you, you were doing fine. Yeah, I was doing fine. I was doing very fine. Then I asked, it was for, actually it was my first time seeing her on that particular day, working together, we just exchanged and then I said, no, I'll pay you, no, and all of that. But then they told me that, that the husband to that lady was killed, was robbed, killed, and all of that. It was my, you know, I was surprised as well because I saw them day before and then now he died and then I asked them, what now brings me here? So what do I, where do I fit in the picture? Where do I fit in the picture? They said, no, you are part of the people that connived in killing that man. Now, remember, they are trying to, even with, on their side, they're trying to connect the dots, and then they're saying that the guy that was working there said, you guys uh, planned and connived with that. I said, I mean, it was my, I think it was 
the first time, if not the second time, seeing that lady, actually. When we saw the first time, I think we were just exchanging numbers. And then the first time that we had, you know, we spoke, it was the day that she was working in my house. And I even left them there to go to work with my brother and all of that. I'm not even, I don't even know. Blank. When did we... Now, plan to kill and what, what was the intention you know, the what, what, why do you want to kill this man why do you want to kill this a, a, a husband to your to the lady who's making your curtains exactly so it I was as confused as you are it's like i don't know what you're talking about they said yeah because we know that even your husband died and you were in the house and then i said so what your husband suppose the husband died and i'm still mourning guys I'm, by that time when this happened i was not well actually i was still mourning the death of my uh, husband then so now they uh, said, okay, fine, we are charging you. They charged me with uh, murder, robbery. I think they gave me six counts. It was murder, robbery, hijacking. All the circumstances okay. that died around, yeah, uh, happened yeah. around. Kidnapping, so they fire, just piled, they just piled yeah. all the cases yeah. on you. Firearm. Did they find, any, they did they find an firearm in your house? I mean, <laughs> I can't even know what they can't even today. Yeah. And yeah, they gave me those six counts. They charged me actually with six counts. Uh, I was then taken to the police station. I was locked up. I was locked up. I went to prison. A nightmare. In Sun City. Yeah, I went to trial now. I stayed there for three months in prison. And I saw the lady as well was also arrested. And in, during that time, because I was... The lady was also arrested now. Yes. She also no, she, isn't that they said now we connive together and all of that. It is now this guy who was doing the... Who was working for them, actually. He was their driver. So he's saying all these things and all of that. So I saw, I was surprised to see the, the lady. But then we were not even talking. I was still angry because I did not know what is happening. Is it her as well that is, you know, putting this whole thing? And I was just confused. And she was also angry. You know, that maybe just, you were involved uh, in the killing yeah, of their husband. All of that, yeah, it was just a nightmare. We stayed there for three months in Johannesburg. Uh, Sun City. Female Correctional Service. Yeah, it was Sun, uh, Sun City. We were in trial for about three months. That was in um, 2000 and, 2005, from September to, from the 29th of, the, 29th of September to the end of December when we were released on bail because remember I was still working and during that period of three months they were still they said okay fine they're still investigating as to how did we do it and all of that and when we went to court for the last time when we were released on bail the, the child said but I'm worried about I mean Antoinette is here she is still mourning and we are looking baby. Remember, remember remember when you uh, especially when you are a woman normally when the husband dies they even look at the insurances what what was the reason behind the killing and all of that what was the motive and your relationship with this woman the whom you did not the know the woman and they find out that no we were just <sighs> it was only them that we knew each other, uh, each other and the issue of insurances they went to check all those kind of things and all of that they said okay fine Perhaps there were millions that maybe were killing these people for. And they found out that there's nothing like that. And I was also working for that matter. Uh. You know, I was doing well for myself. And then then the judge said, at the moment, you no, know, release these people on bail until you come with something constructive Tangible. for me to charge them or for me to keep them in prison. Then we were released on bail. Now, after my release... I had to go back to work. When I went back to work, remember the system automatically checks you, especially when you work in these uh, private companies. You have to go back again and tell them the reasons why you were not there for three months and also for them to reinstate you and all of that. Ah, it was a nightmare when I went to that. Back to work. When I went back to work, people were swearing at me, calling me a murderer. It was on the newspapers, it was everywhere. I was now called this person, the stigma around that uh, lady that kills people and all of kills men and people that I trusted, people, some of the people that I worked with, they believed it because they were reading all, all of that on the, newspaper. on the newspapers as well. And the way, the way they, they put it, it was in such a way that no, it suits me and all of that. You know how they, they profiled write, you. They pro yeah, they profiled me and how this thing occurred and all of that. You know, when I read those newspapers, I was like, what the hell is this? And I was so shocked. The people that I really trusted, they started to reject me. Um, I was no longer part of the community, actually, because it was only my family members, I would say, that believed in me, trusted me, and supported me that much. A lot of people 
really brought you off. Ah, yo, I was so disappointed at, you know, what happened. And when I go to the malls, to the shops, especially where I was staying, they will be swearing at me, go to, to my cars and write yes, things, and... things and put placards and, you know. Yeah, so that's what I experienced. And I decided to leave. Um, Palabura. Uh, no, no, it wasn't Palabura, it was in Ranfontein. I decided to leave Ranfontein to, I relocated to Pretoria now. And I didn't just relocate. What happened is, um, when I was supposed to go back to work, um, I realized that, you know what, I, I can't uh, take it anymore. I was, I did no longer have strength, I was judged. I was no longer free, I was called a murderer. I decided to resign. I lost my job. I resigned. I decided to relocate. The regroup your life. Yeah. yeah, I decided to relocate. But remember, I was still on bail. Not that the case is over. Okay. I was still on bail. And when you're on bail, you must know that you have to keep on attending court. You have yes. to pay lawyers. Yes. Then now, that has to affect your finances. Yeah. Yeah, now we are... Going into that, I had to sell my cars now because from 2005, 2006, 2007, I'm busy going in, in every three months, in and out. I'm going to court, mm. in and out. They keep on uh, postponing the, the matter, but when I go there, remember you the must pay lawyers. they want money. 20, 30,000. Yeah, 15, uh, hundreds. What, there's a lot that I've lost. Sold uh, the cars that I had, all of them. Uh, the house, it was just, uh, the other house that I moved into, we're just uh, buying that house. I decided to give it away and get the money that um, I was, that I felt that it, this would be good to pay the lawyers. My furnishers, my house was like a pawn shop. I was just giving expensive furnishers, like for small amount of money just, just for to me to, to survive. And after <clears throat> taking the pension, remember that now they have to give you your pension money. They gave me uh, the money. All the money went. Into, Give to the lawyers. Yeah, I had to finance the case. Uh. It went on and on. Then my family members had to be involved. I had brothers and sisters that were working. My younger brother, who was a doctor then, had to take uh, his own money, the loans, to assist me. My mother, who worked for about, I think, over 20 years, she had to take a pension then with her pension money to pay lawyer all of it but what is the intention money, what is the intention of these guys who were just pursuing you my money, for that yeah. this guy this guy i'm worried about this guy who framed this story yeah what was when you in in hindsight when you look back mm. what was the intention I was it a problem at work I was it a problem with the, the, the i will the, not really say because the thing is i don't want to talk too much about something that i don't know because i know the effect that it might make okay, okay. as it happened to me so i don't want to talk for him he mm. knows what he was doing mm. and the reasons are known by him because whatever that i could say now about what he was doing it might be maybe less of a but he has done more damage you know in in my life, I would say, because obviously not only my life, but it affected a whole lot of things. Mm. But I don't know what, what is his reasons. That's for him, yeah, to deal with. So then in 2007, that was three years. Three years uh, later. Three years uh, later, because now I became a pedestrian. I did not have a car anymore. Uh. My younger brother decided to also give me his car to use it a week later. I was hijacked at gunpoint in Pretoria. Um, I was hijacked, they stole the car, but fortunately it was recovered, so it was just one tragedy after the other that was happening in my life. And in 2009 now, mm. that is four to, yeah, four, four years later, mm. now the matter has to go to high court. Mm. Yeah, to, to high court. But during this time, like I said, my mother lost her money. She did not enjoy her pension money. Yes, actually. your brother My brothers, is in my debt. sisters, my siblings did not enjoy their money. They, they were in debt. You were, a pro you were a problem in the family. I was a problem in the family. I was, I was a problem in the but family. At least they believed in you. They believed in me. Yeah. And yeah, they really supported me. And thank you, my family mm. members. I love you so much for that. Oh, did you hear that, guys? <laughs> She's sending a... Uh, my brothers and 
Ken Sani wa Ken Sani. Na Ken Sani, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, they supported me all the way. Then in 2009, in June, on the 19th of June, yeah, that was when the matter was finalized. When the matter was finalized, the trial only took uh, a week. It was started on Monday. On Friday, <coughs> I was now sentenced to life imprisonment. I was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. And to my surprise, when the judge was saying uh, to us on the counts, like the counts that I mentioned to you, the robbery, what, 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 kidnapping, she said, I can see that in all of this, you did not, uh, you did not conspire, you were not part of the conspiracy because I mean it went on trial. They've seen. They even said, you know, I remember the judge said it. Even on the transcript is still there that, you know, this, what this guy is saying is nonsensical. That's when even I, I started claiming that word nonsense. He said it's nonsensical, and that's when I said, at least you know, justice will prevail at the end of the day. Mm. I'm going to be released. I was mm. so optimistic and I was so happy, and I'm like, okay, I know that at the end of the day. Now I'll at least someone they can see yeah, some light. You can see some light. I'll be vindicated. I don't want to lie. I didn't see this coming. Then the judge said, "Okay, fine on, on conspiracy. You are not guilty. On robbery, you are not guilty. Firearm, ammunition, all these charges you are not guilty. But then I find you guilty on murder. Okay, find me guilty on murder. Okay, fine. Then after that." They said, okay, fine, they are handing out, out down the judgment, um, the sentence. I mean, then they said, okay, fine, we are sentenced for that. We are sentencing you to life imprisonment. I was shattered. I was shocked. I like... Boom, on your face. On my face. Even my, when I looked back, because my siblings were there, I just looked at them. And I did not see anyone's eyes or face. All of them were like, their heads were like this. They were shocked. I was shocked. I thought this woman is playing. I looked at her, I thought she'll say, no, I'm just joking. I stood there and I looked at her for a very long time. She said, I, you, and I said, take, the, the, take this woman down. They are sentenced to life in prison. And the woman was a judge? Yes, it was a woman. And I remember during the week, we... Where because you know in this case it really there was a point where I was really feeling angry at some point where I even told her that she need to recuse to recuse herself because there was a point where she was like, yeah you come here you are arrogant and all of that and you are guilty of this. She said this before even we were shortly before we were sentenced. So I stood up. I said no you have to recuse yourself. Already you find me guilty on this before even the trial. On is what it? grounds? I mean, yeah. And yeah, I remember standing up telling her that, recuse yourself from that seat. I cannot, you are not going to sentence me. Even when she was, uh, you know, giving us this, uh, this uh, sentence, I was no longer listening to her because like already I could see that. The attitude was. Yeah, the attitude and okay, at the end of the day, we were then sentenced and we went down. Four years later. That was it, yeah, four Boom. years later. Back to Sun City. Back to Sun City. I went back to Sun City now to serve life imprisonment. Life imprisonment. Went back to Sun City when I was in Sun City. It wasn't easy. It was very challenging. The first years, 2009, 10, 11, then I said, okay, fine, because I have lived to appeal. Let me appeal the matter. I appealed the matter. When I appealed the matter, it was now I appealed to full bench. Remember from high court, then I had to go to full bench. Now, now you know these legal systems. Yes. Now, I, me, me, I'm blank. I'm now learning now. There's a half bench yeah, and a full, full bench. Full bench now. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, it was a, a, a high court is one judge. The yeah. Full bench is three judges. Three judges. That had to look at the matter and the revise the notes. And revise the notes, the transcript to say, let us see what went wrong now. Mm. Then. Uh, that was in 2012. So now you, spend, you spent how many years there? Now? now I was now four years. Four when years. I, when they appeal now, they said... Okay, so three months earlier dead. plus four years. Yeah, now now it's four years. When I appealed, when they, the, the matter was to be had now at full bench, it was four years. These four years was like hell. It wasn't easy. 
hours in a big cell. Hold it right there. Let me just take a glass of water and uh, cool myself off. This story is getting a bit hectic here. You know, while we're busy complaining about the shortage of bread and milk in our houses, hey, the Lord is not blessing me. Hey, there are people who are going through real problems. And I think I read a story once where someone was to cry for a pair of shoes until they found someone without feet. We'll be back right after the break. Thank you. Take a seat, madam. man's face. He killed your brother. Make messy moves with Star Side. This is just the beginning. Make massive moves. Get out! Get out of this place! I love you. Do you love me? Yes. I like this. Someone stole from me yesterday. It was not my fault, no. Hmm? Please, Lisa, please. Your head. That's your head. No, don't shoot, sir. Please. Please don't kill us. I give anything you want. Make messy moves with Star Side. Welcome back, welcome back. We are listening to a moving story. Now I almost feel like now I must become a movie producer now. I want to become a movie director. Some of these stories I think are worth putting on silver screen. Sure. Because this is, a, this is a real life story. Boom! Take her down. Yeah. Four years behind bars. Then he decided to appeal to the full bench. Yeah, actually after four years now, they, they, they told me that, no, okay, my meta can be had mm. at a full bench. Uh, during that time, I knew that, okay, if the matter is going to be heard by three judges... At least. At least. Now there's no way that they can use this. What I mean, I was at work. My alibi says I was at work. All the records. Said, all the records. My telephone records and everything. So I'm like, okay, then this time... I might be lucky. Uh, definitely then uh, justice will prevail. I'll go home. I'll be vindicated. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I said tight about it. When I heard that the matter would be heard, I had a call that, okay, fine, your matter will be heard on this particular day. I think it was in February. was excited. Even in the cell where I was staying, you know. My James, you are a again. I am a is a pillar. It was a big cell now. Hey, man, I'm going home. I packed everything. My bags on because I was sleeping, you know, in, in, in Bunkers, prison. yeah. Yeah, this what we call, they, they call them gaga beds because it's double gaga. It's top, top deck. It's, it's a top decker bed. I was yeah. now sleeping on the bottom one, you know, so you are fire. Fire, you have achieved your sleep <laughs> on the bottom bed. So I gave away my clothes, my whatever. I'm like, I mean, I'm going home, guys. You know, I was told was to allowed to go to You know, I was in prison, there were those who like, oh, this is August born and mm. all of that. And others were excited. We'll see when you, we'll yeah. see, we'll see so when you have. Me, like, but, but hey, they like to say, uh, yeah, see how you get out of this. So, okay, then I um, went to the bench. Yeah, I, I went to no. They actually, my family had to go to court. I, I did not go to court on that particular day. I just had to go to keep on going to the telephone booth to call them to check on the progress. So they discuss without you being there? Yeah. The three judges yeah, just review yeah. And then they'll just the evidence just and then... Take the, yeah, tell the advocate if maybe you are to be released, then they'll send the um, uh, facts to prison and all of that. 
So I went to the telephone booth, I think it was around 12 in the afternoon. I called, um, called them. When I called, they said, no, what time are you coming to fetch me? Now I'm telling them, what time are you coming to fetch me? They said, Until it's, unfortunately, they dismissed your appeal. What does that mean? Now? What? Dismissed my appeal? What now? They said, no. They said you're only eligible for parole at least in 2037. 2037. Yeah, that is eligible for parole. We not may that you, not that we you may want to consider. To be, yes, you are eligible for parole sometime. 20, depending on your behavior or whatsoever, around 20 because now then you'll be you will have served 25 years between 2035 2037. That's when you'll at least be eligible for parole. So that's how my appeal was dismissed, to say that they don't see any fault in what they... What goes I, through your mind when you hear that? And I'm like, what? And I know that these people are... They cannot joke like that, because they know what can happen to me if you say something like that. I can even, you know... You know, I, I'm like, what are you saying? Are you serious? I said, no, we are serious, Antoinette. Just go stay strong. We are coming on Saturday to see you. Mm. I went back to the cell. I went back to the cell crawling, crying. I cried that day when I went back to the cell, went to sleep. Others were laughing at me. We told you, hey, this is prison. This relax. Is, yeah, relax. Hey. We are going to be here. It wasn't easy. That day, you know, that actually, I think that was the worst day. Of your life. Of my life, because that was the only hope that I had. That was the only hope that I had. And then on, from that day, I said, okay, now I think it's better if I... You accept it. Yeah. No, I did not want to accept it. I said, I, it's better if maybe I take my life. Oh. I'd rather commit suicide. I can't take it anymore, because obviously that means I'll never go home. I'll die here. Um, by then, I think I was obviously over 30 i'm like i'm going to die here in prison There's 60 no something then yeah mm. i started i started losing it honestly mm. i started losing it from that particular mm. day i did not eat anymore i wanted to literally commit suicide it didn't work um i i, I just disintegrated i was no longer myself mm. there was no hope there was no future mm. and remember when this happens you don't even have visitors anymore to come and see you in prison. Mm. Remember there was a time, even my family members, obviously they did not have money anymore. Mm. They won't be coming to visit you every, you know, Often. time and again. Yeah, so they'll be like, at least we are coming next month. Once a month. Yeah, yeah, once a month. Sometimes after two months, they will just come to bring you the things that we need. There were times where I'll sit there without having anything. And remember this time now, my bank balance, being the woman that I was before, my bank balance is on 0.00. I had nothing. Mm. No friends, nothing. Nobody was coming to me. But the banks are not, are not polite. They are still taking bank charges. <laughs> <laughs> you end up with them, your minors. You end up with the minors. Is it there? But I took that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having to. You can laugh about it, but I know it is a bad story. No, it was, it was, it was the, a. Then it was a very terrible you know, situation to go through. I'll never wish that for anybody. Mm. I'll never wish that for anybody. It was a tough time. They mm. say tough time, really. Yeah, never last. Wow. Maybe they talk about that. Yeah, tough people do. But then, since this, then, this 2009. Yeah, this is not, this is not, yeah, since this 2009, now this is 2012. When this happened, when Three I years felt like later. Four, four years later, four years later, that's when I felt like now I'm disintegrated. So basically, from 2004 to 2012, sure, you are like living. Me, I'm living I'm a, just, a life that is. I, I don't even know how to call that. You, you may give that it that part of your life. Yeah, just give it any name. It's fine. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So then, um, in 2012, because I saw that now I was really shattered. Then there was a time where I decided, I remember it was um, the Minister of Correctional Services, then it was uh, uh, Umam Viwe, mm. my piece. I remember there was a time where she came, you know, present sometimes, you know, it can be very terrible. There were times where when she comes and then she listens to what we, our needs and so forth, and then we wanted to go to single cell because we wanted to study. So mm. she said, no, people who are studying should go to single cell and all of that to single cells. And 
I was one of those people. I said, I just want to go to single cell, to stay in a single cell. Mm. When I went to single cell, um, unless you're alone in the room, yeah, you can read, you can, yeah. But then the first time, the first day when I entered the single cell, when I looked at the roof and the ground, I'm like, this is where I'm going to die. This is the roof. This is my tombstone. This is where my life will end. But then, what can I do? At least I was in that space where you are alone, more than in a communal cell where you are about over 40 something, mm. sharing one toilet and blah, blah, blah. But then, when I was there, that's when I had, I believe that I had a divine visitation mm. in a single cell. That's when I started like um, telling myself that, you know what, even though they sentenced to me, I know that the word says we are hard pressed on every side, but never crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, mm. but not abandoned. Started finding a bit of yourself. Yeah. You know, struck down, but never destroyed. That means that I might be struck down, but this is not over. I'm let still alive. Just stand up. Let me stand up. I just had to take ownership of my personal development. Mm. I made that decision. Because remember, when you're in prison, there are spiritual workers that will be coming to visit you, uh, visit you encourage and motivate. Then those things, the words, they might talk after inspiration, uh, those inspirational talks or way, um, motivational talks, after they've left, then they started at least, because you make a decision as a person to say, okay, I want to take this. Then mm. that's when I started saying, you know what? This might work for me. Let me just rise start wearing these high heels. I was wearing high heels inside. I'm telling you, I'm like, what? Let's slay the prison. I'm like, what? Let's slay the I'm prison. Let me slay it. I'm <laughs> going to wear my high heels and mourn. I'm just going to do this thing. I'm going to go to school, out study. And I looked back, I said, okay, fine. I was doing mining engineering. I went to inquire because there was a, I was staying in a section that is called UNISA section. It's mm. only students that are studying in UNISA. Mm. I wanted to do mining engineering because I loved, mining was my first love. So, mm. but then they remember when there are no practicals and lectures, it won't be easy. Then I said, okay, let me look for something that I'll do or mm. a, any other faculty then. When I looked at my situation, and I, I said I wanted something that would have to deal with myself. Mm. Because in the mining, it's all about you, machines, and yeah. you know, and, and so forth. But then I want something that would have to... Personal development. Yeah, that has to do with my personal development. Then I s researched, I checked in the Department of Theology. There was this course, uh, which was uh, Theological Ethics. And then I checked the modules. I saw social ethics, sexual ethics, and... Uh, things like community ministry, medical ethics. I said, I like this course because, I mean, it deals with the mm. with me as a person, with the community, something that will have to deal with other people, mm. to inspire other people and all of mm. that. I said, okay, I think I love this one because okay. it has to do with, you know, the aspect it, of it, you, 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 you could connect well. with it. You could connect. Yeah, to yeah, I just saw myself connecting with it. Mm. I said, okay, fine. Let me do this one. I chose that one. I decided to do that degree in theological ethics, and yeah, I did very well. I passed, I, I at least got about 24 distinctions in mm. that uh, degree. I passed it with cum laude, mm. did that degree, started attending courses, do Buma, started to, because I, there were people that, you know, there were people that were, you know, affected and infected by HIV. I started mm. to go on to do the, the courses that has to do with helping them. I just mm. didn't like to see people suffering and all of that. Mm. And there was a section that was called B section. In this B section, there were people that were doing minimum sentences because me now was in a maximum. Mm. I was, I was maximum sentence, yeah. yeah. So I was staying in, before in cell seven day, it was in a maximum cells for people who are doing over 10 and above, life sentence and all of that. But I'll see these people depressed when they come back from phone. Some of them, they'll have stroke. Some of them, they'll be taking taking them out. They say they committed suicide. Some of them, they'll be depressed until they die there in prison and all of that. I'm like, no, this is not this is not how it's supposed to be. So I just started to go and- To the B section. Some, yeah, to, to the, the less, be, to, to the more fortunate than you. Exactly. Look, so hey guys, you are crying. You are crying, me, look at me. Me, I'm here for life. Hey, I started doing that and I started, see myself inspiring other people and the management as well there when there are functions and then they'll give me a role as a MC and all of that. I started to keep myself in your high heels, girl. In my high heels. You know, you, 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 you. wearing high heels. <laughs> 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 I could almost hear in those concrete floors. <laughs> 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 
bar madam uten i'm wearing high heels and then i'm like oh the life for Biden. Hmm. Mm -mm. Can't me. keep a good girl down. I never. I said, uh-uh, this one, I'm making a decision. It's hmm. a choice. I'm if I'm going to leave here, I might as well just leave. Yes, I said, I, I, I was... Attitude. Even, I was even telling them that, you know, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Like hmm. Carl Jung said, I said, I'm becoming this woman. I'm this woman. I'm this queen. I'm Nobody taking over this prison. This is who I am. Yes, I was like that. And... I was just living like that. If something happens in the prison and I feel that, no, this one is violating my rights, they knew I'll take them to court. I'll be going up and down. I'll be like, I was just this person that was just inspired and I did not want anybody to take advantage of me. Mm. I think that's one thing that prison, you know, taught, taught you. me. I'm like, I'm not going to stand up anybody. because, yeah, I, I feel like from the subs and everything that happened to me, I just allowed certain things to happen. I was yeah. like, no, I'm not going to allow this. Not anymore. Not with, my, with me, no, this is who I am, I'm Antoinette, I don't care who says what, now I am standing. This mm. is for, I'm doing this for myself, not for mm. other people. I had to do that for mm. myself. And then, yeah, that's when I kept uh, that spirit going until we went to graduate. Another cause, that's when I met this certain guy that said, you know, Antoinette, I understand, I've heard about your case, this and that, and I mean, I'm studying, I need to, I want to study your transcripts and all of that, and we'll tell you what to do. And we, you know... Exchanged numbers. Yeah, actually, uh, not numbers per se, but then I told my family members about him, they took the transcripts, they took them to uh, Medium B, where he was, and... He's a lo he was in prison also. He was in prison also. So he started studying your scripts. Yeah, I tried. He was doing law. He was yeah, doing law. He was doing, and no, that's when he started doing law after See, my with, case. Because, with your case. Yeah, because the way he came to me, I'm like, I looked at him like this. I'm not. Advo advocates have failed. Yeah, this, but, you know, like, who are you? And then I'm like, he was wearing prisoner, prisoner. I'm like, what are you saying? I said, no, I want to. I believe that God has sent me to help. I'm like, who are you? You are wearing prisoner, prisoner. It's a lot of ways. So wow. He went on to read the transcript. After reading the transcript, said, no, Antoinette, look for an advocate. I can see they've had these people. I've read your transcript. But remember, I cannot go to court. I'm not an advocate. Mm. But you need to look for an advocate that will assist. And there's an advocate that is uh, called Paul Shapiro. Mm. He was an old man, a Jew. In Pretoria. Yeah, he was in Johannesburg. Okay. Yeah. The Shapiro, yeah, yeah, that's Shapiro, a popular yeah, name in Nini. Shapiro, yeah, Paul Shapiro. And then he said, no, there's a guy by the name of Paul Shapiro. Um, I believe that he will assist. I'll give him the transcripts and everything. And then he went through the transcripts and then he highlighted what he sees and everything. And then the advocate came when he came to prison. I remember there was, you know, he was, he was old by then, mm. uh, Mr. Shapiro. I remember when he was like coming there to visit me. Sometimes he'd be tired. And then the, the, the warders would be like, and you know God can use I've learned that God that of finished the old man was listening <laughs> ah, that old man is very shrewd yeah. make no mistake he's yeah. very shrewd I'm like God can use anybody wow yeah as much as he was I was you gave him a I'm chance Christian he's a Jew so that's when I still learned that you know never discriminate anybody mm. based on their religion mm. their whatsoever their age and all of that so yeah so that man old man really um yeah took the case took, took the, the case. case further and he really thought he went back to even look for the guys that i was working with remember now the harmony god it was 10 years later mm. obviously the system now has changed there's change and, and there's more transparency and he was able now to access other information yes the man had to go through all of that the people that uh, he took the case, he, yeah, he, he, took took the took the case, case properly he, he ran with it properly and he made his own research and said okay fine i'm going to take now the matter to supreme court remember it was from full bench mm -hmm. three judges Supreme Court so is how many one bench, now? One bench, three benches. Now there are five judges. Oh, five benches now. Yeah, now it's in Supreme Court. There are five judges that had to listen to the matter in Supreme Court. He took the matter in 2012. Then during that uh, period when I was, uh, when he was busy uh, with the case, uh, this um, guy now started to propose me and all of that. In prison. And, yeah, in prison. So, yeah, we ended up getting married in prison, white wedding. Yeah. We in got, prison. Yeah, we married in prison. <laughs> we got married in prison. 
so we married in 2014 and yeah i was doing life sentence then and yeah we got married but at least there was something keeping your life now yes husband next door husband uh. next door uh. <laughs> yeah so we got married in prison and uh, but how does that happen now it does you know we have to you know the, the, the system we have to there are those policies that you have to you know each and every prison they've got their own policies. that is allowed mm. it's it's yeah we, we've got the right to get married in prison but yo, you need to follow the protocol procedures and you know mm. their policies and all of that so yeah it's you a, surely know it's much more, you surely know much more than i do even yes. procedures of getting married in prison <laughs> you know, i've been learning benches now i'm even learning marital issues you learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> never judge a book by its cover yeah <laughs> i'm telling you <laughs> yeah so in full bench now when the matter was being had by supreme the court now. supreme court yeah, now I'm this married woman. I am a chauke hmm. in prison. Hmm. You see how God works. Yeah, so when I was uh, busy there, that, that was now 2016 hmm. when uh, the matter was heard. Hmm. The five judges now. Yeah, the five judges. On that particular day, uh, around 10, it was after my husband came to visit me, he went back to the section and then I went to the section as well. Took the phone, I went to the telephone booth, took the phone, called the... Shapiro. Yeah, I called uh, Mr. Shapiro. Uh, when I called Mr. Shapiro, I said, Antoinette, and I was surprised he answered the phone, it was still ill. I'm like, hey, maybe they're still busy. And with me, I was so anxious, I'm like, no, it's just checking. You know when you are used to bad news, because it has been bad news for me since 2004, mm, yeah. until 20. Mercy. I'm like, Mr. Shapiro, what's happening and all of that? He said, no, your papers are coming. What are you still doing there? Go pack your things. You are out. Ah. Yeah. The way I screamed, I cried, I laughed. You didn't know how to feel. I didn't. I had mixed emotions. But it was so sad at the same time. Mm. Because I really felt in that when the pay, all this pain came on that particular day. You have to go and face up life now. And yeah. Freedom I'm was like, now painful. I'm like, what? actually it was about what has happened, what I was put through until this day when I heard you are free. When I heard him saying, start packing your bags. I'm busy. We are busy with your papers. papers. We're coming to pick you up. Yeah. Tell your family members to come and pick you up because, because I'm still, I was still somewhere in Bloomfontein there. They mm. were doing that in Bloomfontein, somewhere in Bloomfontein. said, I'm still here. So tell your family members to come there and fetch you. Yeah, it was an emotional day for me, mm. that particular day. Cried, packed everything. A lot of people were shocked and surprised. The whole prison was just making noise because now I was this lady that was sentenced to prison to life imprisonment who was wearing high heels and everybody knew mm. that prison that we know Antoinette yeah. you know, he was life sentence mm. because you know, see someone when all are. yeah <laughs> yeah so it was that and yeah I was then uh, released on that particular day it was on the 7th, 16th, 16th, 17th of February uh, 2016 mm. when I was finally released it was on my sister's birthday my sister was taking care of my son wow it was her birthday on that particular day when i was released mm. yeah then by then your son is your son is 